Welcome everyone. My name is um, Ted Fisher and we are here today to talk about data science, um, best and worst practices. Um, I am an offering manager, another term for product manager for IBM. Um, before uh, moving to product management, I, um, I was a data scientist consultant working on particularly US government projects for many years. Um, and my the presentation about to show um, really reflects that experience. Um, okay, so let's uh, talk about the, the worst practice the, that I have seen a lot, which is the belief in the unicorn. So, and I'm gonna do that by going through a, an analogy. So we're gonna talk about airplane, airplane pilots and you're thinking, well, this is about data science, right? But it is, uh, let me explain. Uh, you'll see the analogy in a bit. So, so let's imagine the following requirements to be an airplane pilot. So uh, knowledge of the principles of flight, that makes sense, right? If you were gonna fly an airplane, you'd have to know how flying, planes go up, go down, and things like that. Um, certainly you want your pilot to know all the levers on the plane, and especially uh, for uh, very advanced jets. Um, there's a lot of levers, a lot of knobs. Um, you know, It's not something you just walk in off the street to do uh, and go fly the airplane, especially with lots of people on it. But now let's suppose the following are also uh, set stated to be a job requirement. Yeah, you actually don't not just have to know how to fly your own airplane. You have to build your own airplane, uh, maybe from a kit, uh, preferably from scratch. Um, and then actually what really is wanted is not to acknowledge how to design a new type of airplane, something that uh, maybe it's an adaptation of an existing airplane, but hasn't really been uh, done before. So, uh, so you may be thinking, what, what's going on with the last two requirements? Well, now let's go um, to data science, and here was where we'll get to the analogy. So let's say you need one person demonstrated knowledge of how to prepare data and build a model properly. And I think, I would think almost any data scientist needs to have exposure um, to do their job, needs to have exposure with statistical techniques, needs to work with large amounts of data, um, and know some of the uh, sort of pitfalls, which I will be going over in a little bit about building a model properly. Um, uh, knowledge of statistical principles, machine learning algorithms and big data. That's uh, absolutely true. Uh, you really do need that. But a lot of job descriptions say you need to have expert knowledge of coding in multiple computer languages and Hadoop. And in fact, a lot of job descriptions highly recommend knowing how to create your own algorithm, i.e. having a PhD. And I, a, a requirement for PhD is basically saying, we want to create our own algorithm. We're not happy with all the algorithms that are out there. In my view, those last two requirements are not absolutely critical. And the idea that you can have one person with all of these skill sets um, and you can that will solve your entire data science problem is, in my view, a myth and a worse practice. So um, what you see here is a poster that a um, analyst uh, firm has um, put out. There are very similar uh, descriptions by others about all the things that a data scientist is, needs to be successful. And they are, you know, include some of the things I, I do agree are, are needed. You know, you need the math and statistics knowledge, um, to, you know, ability to communicate, uh, you know, domain knowledge, yeah, programming so is definitely very good, very useful. But really, are you gonna really find one person who has all of these skill sets? I really, really doubt that. And, and but, the pro but there's still a belief, because uh, people just don't wanna take the time, that if you don't, you need to find the one person that has all of these. So here's where the analogy uh, fits in with the data science. So, so the real requirements are for the airplane pilot, knowledge the principles of flight, and for the data scientist, knowledge of statistical principles, algorithms, and big data. You need knowledge of the fundamentals. Uh, another real requirement uh, for both airplane pilots and data scientists is you know, knowledge of the knobs and levers. Uh, an airplane pilot, in this case, they have literal knobs and levers. Um, for data scientists, it's the figurative knobs and levers, you know, whether what, using code or using a tool to, to apply, um, prepare your data and build your model. The myths start getting in, in terms of how you do this. So the, the myth in the airplane pilot is the ability to build your own plane. For data scientists, I would argue again, it's a myth 
that you, it is critical to have expert knowledge of coding in multiple computer languages and accessing to do. Yes, knowing coding is very helpful, and there's a lot of people doing R and Python, and it's a very valid way to do data science. But there's a lot of data science software, such as IBM SPSS Modeler, that allows you to build models, do the complete life cycle without code. And, and you can also use IBM SPSS Modeler to access Hadoop as well. And then the final myth is knowledge to design a new, something new, whether it's a new airplane or a new algorithm. There are literally hundreds of algorithms out there um, for all kinds of situations. And it's, a, in my view, a very rare situation where a, a new algorithm has to be created from scratch to solve your business problem. So let's talk about some other worst practices and corresponding best practices. So I'm going to talk about um, two types of worst practices. One is sort of the business focus, you know, sort of like how a data science team relates to the uh, sponsoring business and solving the business problem, and then I'll get to some technical worst practices. The first worst practices that I've seen is that the data science project can be re justified as research or investigational without a clear business objective. So um, people in the business say, oh, data science is hot. Oh, I hear this article, we, we got to do data science, we got to do machine learning, we got to do AI, you know, whatever the term of, of art is. And we got we to gotta start right away and we got to hire a bunch of people. Um, but they don't define the clear business objective. And that's a problem because in data science, if you don't have a business objective or to be technical about it, the target variable, you don't really have a model that can be deploy for business results. So the result is the data science team has to sort of figure out what the target variable is, which may not solve the business problem, which is why they're hired. So what really should be happening is that even for a prototype or a proof of concept, even if your organization is just starting out with data science, you need to have the business stakeholders engaged to provide a clear business objective. And it has to be very clear. It can't be just say, make me more money. That's not clear enough for a data science problem. It has to be about something specific, whether it's customer churn, segmentation, predictive maintenance. There's many, many use cases, but it has to be very clearly defined. Another worst practice I've seen is the project can start or proceed without executive sponsorship. So it starts at the low level or mid level, um, the team's hired, perhaps they have the budget to do so, um, but, but the executives never understand or the leaders of the organization never understand why this project has kicked off the ground, what's going on. So the, they show the, uh, you know, you might have some great models, but, and they're all wonderful, but there's no approval to deploy because the executives never agreed or the leaders never agreed to do so. Um, and, you know, yes, if you, maybe if you're working with a small company, you can just call the executive on the phone and uh, bring them over and convince them. But, you know, in a lot of midsize or large organizations, that's not easy. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the, and the executives are busy. You can't just call them over. And so what you really need to make sure you have is a sponsor from the very beginning, someone who can help justify the project. And if you do get valuable results from your models, um, being able to convince other stakeholders of the, uh, of the need to deploy the models. Because without deployment, you don't have value. So a third worst practice, which I personally have experienced, is the line of business is too busy. The uh, data science team, perhaps with, you know, the hire some rock star, should do the project on its own. And I've seen this where the value of business says, we don't want to be involved. We, we've got our own problems. And so, um, you know, you just handle this, okay? And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens, all right? Well, the problem is that, a, you know, what you're really trying to do is, with data science and machine learning is not just create some models and play around with programming. You're trying to improve your organization's business. And so the line of business has to be involved because you might well change their business process or what they're doing. So what may happen, what happened with me with the line of business that they were too busy was that they in the end rejected the model because it didn't meet their requirements. Um, so it, you know, it, the, uh, so the, what is ne thus needed is the line of business 
even if they're busy, has to be part of the project team. Now, grant they don't have to be sitting with the data scientists. They don't have to be, you know, I mean, ideally they would be, but, you know, at least engage them in regular status meetings, regular updates to explain what is the, um, you know, how, what is going on in the project? What is happening? What are the results? And, you know, if they are valuable, how can they be, um, uh, how they will actually help the line of business. So another worst uh, practice, and I've already referred to this, is the guidance from the line of business is vague. So make us more money. Uh, and as I've already uh, Im implied, um, this is not satisfactory. Uh, you know, you can't build a model to say, make us more money. You need a something in particular you're trying to predict or understand. Um, I mean, and, and so what really is needed is, you know, you start with the line of business um, in a before, you know, in a business understanding phase to understand what is the goal or the target variable. Um, and, you know, in my, if the line of business doesn't really understand it, it maybe, you know, the data science team can help suggest something, but the line of business, the stakeholder has to agree to this and uh, on the something specific, because this really informs the whole project from the very beginning. All right, so now let's move on to some technical uh, worst and corresponding best practices. So um, another one that I've seen is um, information technology is too busy to assist. So the, you know, the, the, the belief is the data science team, again, with the help of these rock stars who know everything, should do the project on its own. Um, so um, the idea is, you know, and it may work in some organizations that allow shadow IT. You just, the data science team just, goes ahead and does their own deployment. I mean, you can, you can always uh, run prop models through, you know, using your own programs and do it in some kind of standalone or siloed way. But really, that's not gonna help too much because the, the, the value out of data science and machine learning is changing your business processes, changing your decisions based on the information available in the model. And that's best done and definitely best done in production environments, the, the, the very environments that IT controls. Um, and so if you're saying, well, you know, I'm going to deploy without going into production, uh, again, maybe uh, in some or, or cases, yeah, that might work. Um, but in, in, in uh, the va large cases, and if you really want to get ROI, you're basically going to be shut out if you don't have the, um, if you have not involved IT. So you absolutely need IT in the project team from the again from the beginning, and I would argue from the beginning, because the technology choices that you use to build the model must also be available in production. So, for instance, if I've heard a case where um, a team uh, spent weeks and months building models in R, and they were good models, um, but it turns out that R could not be deployed in production. Um, so maybe if they had worked with IT from the beginning, they could have put R in production, gotten the approvals, but you can't just assume that the technology you use to build a model is available in production without consulting the information technology department. So another worst practice I've seen is no methodology is used for the project or a general IT-based methodology is used. So it used to be many years ago, waterfall was used for all IT projects, so I've seen data science projects use waterfall. Nowadays, agile is much more uh, prevalent. So we, there's a you know, attempt to use agile as a, um, you know, as, a, as a methodology. The problem with general IT-based methodologies is that there's an assumption that there are specific known requirements that you can execute immediately, or, with, or not immediately, with time, in your code uh, in, in what you're trying to build. Um, but in data science, you don't always know exactly what you can get out of. So um, data, the data that you're working with is an unknown quantity at the start of the project. Uh, you may not fully understand it. There may be problems with the data. There may be you know, issues with the data. And so a data science project in many ways is like a research project. You're trying to find things and discover things. And with research, you can't always predict the timelines uh, of what's going to be involved. In fact, you may have to uh, go backwards, you may based on things you discovered later on, have to go backwards 
and fix some things, for instance, in data preparation before you can build a model, you can deploy a model. So if you just use an IT method, uh, methodology or worse, no methodology at all, you're gonna miss steps that are needed for successful projects. Um, so now a lot, um, there are a number of methodologies that out, are there out there. Uh, the one that's the most long lasting is called CRISPDM. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard about it, look it up. Uh, it's, 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 it's on Google and in lots of places. Um, it's, this methodology has been around for 20 years, but in the last poll from Katie Nuggets, um, it was the uh, most widely used data science methodology. Um, there are though many other methodologies uh, that have been published, uh, including by IBM. And, and you know, and uh, Chris, Chris Jam is deficient in some ways, particularly on deployment. Um, so I'm not arguing to use Chris DM. I'm arguing to say that you should use a data science oriented methodology that reflects the fact that you are working with data that is not known and that you can't always assume you know how long it takes to build a good model. So Another worst practice, technically focused worst practice is that the data used for model building is obtained from a separate place than the um, implementation or production environment, and no attempt is made to match the data. So it's often the case um, at the start of the project that uh, I've seen, especially more security focused organizations, that the production environment is locked down, the data scientist doesn't have access to it, it's too difficult and too time consuming to get the data. So, but there may be conveniently some data warehouse or data mart or something else that has this data and, or supposedly has this data. So, it, so the data scientist is told to just use that data instead. Um, the problem occurs when the production environment may, it doesn't mirror this other environment. Uh, and frequently with data warehouses, there are attempts to, you know, uh, make the, to rationalize the structure of the data, uh, to change the format of the data, change the way it's stored. And this might be good from an efficiency point of view or storage point of view, um, but isn't very good from a data science point of view. The data scientist really needs the data as it looks like in production to build the model. And so if, now, it may be, again, because of security concerns that it is impossible to get an extract of production data. But if that is the case, the data has to be obtained elsewhere, you have to really work with the um, IT gr uh, group or the owners of the production data to make sure there is a mapping from your data source and your production data. If you don't, the models will, may rely on variables that are not available in production or are not populated in production. And I've get per personally seen this where some data was populated in the extract I obtained from another data source, but it turned out it was fed from a no another system, not the production system that was going to be used to score the model. And so the models that were built on the uh, extracted data were useless because they relied on uh, information that was just not available in production. So when and understanding the data, you have to actually understand the governance and the, you know, where the data came from. Um, so if you're not really sure where, if, this, if you want to deploy your model, and you're not really sure if this data that you've got from a different source is in production, it definitely engage the production data expert and make sure that the data is in production and also make sure you understand that how the data got transformed from production to this different data source. Um, if you don't understand it, there's a risk that the data in your development environment or your, you know, the data or your, the, in your training environment is different. And this could degrade the results of the model because the patterns in your training data don't reflect the patterns in, in the production side. So let's move to some more technically false best practices. And one I've seen fairly recently is a belief that data understanding is not necessary. Um, advanced techniques will handle any issues. So one of the phases of CRISPDM, that, um, the, that methodology method before is data understanding. So understanding you know, what's missing about your data, anomalies about your data, uh, you know, what the, uh, you know, you know, the, the uh, um, distribution of the data, uh, things like that. And, um, but, you know, I've seen quite a number of people say, and, you know, but understanding data takes a lot of time. 
Um, I mean, there are tools and techniques to help you understand the data, but it is an extra step. And some people will say, well, we don't have time for this. So let's just flow it through our automatic data cleanser um, and we'll just, or, or some algorithms uh, that can accept wide data sets and we'll just, uh, you know, uh, hope for the best. So, um, so a lot of these advanced techniques will clean up many common data problems. And I, um, that's, that's very true. But you know, there's some things that only a real understanding of the data will help identify. So one is a spurious correlation. So if you throw in all your data into your model, you know, um, you may be including things like ID numbers or system generated variables or things like that, that your experts, your domain experts would know that uh, are basically useless information, they're noise. Um, and you might say, well, my algorithm will figure out that they're noise. But, you know, I, I, hopefully many of you have heard of the term spurious correlation, which is basically um, indications where two variables that are totally unrelated um, have a good correlation. So it'd be something like, you know, um, the days people eat ice cream are also the days that uh, people eat more ice cream are the days that the stock market goes up, uh, something like that, you know. And if you look Google spurious correlations, you'll see many actual examples. Um, and uh, the problem is, yes, you, you, you can hope that the, uh, your advanced techniques will get rid of the spurious correlation, but what's the, what's the most frightening is if your spurious correlations with your target variable, then the algorithm will probably say, wow, this is a really good predictor of my target variable and I'll put a lot of weight on this. Um, so in general, uh, you, you really don't want to do that. Another problem that you can't assume will go away is circular logic. And that's a case where the predictor of the model is a symptom or consequence of what is being predicted. So for instance, um, if you're trying to predict buying propensity um, and you're scoring the model um, you know, let's say before the offer goes out, but then you include a variable whether the person clicked on an advertisement um, that of the email, let's say you sent out, um, and that you're um, uh, before buying. That's a problem because if you're if the if the scoring of that customer occurs before the email is sent out, uh, then and and but you include a variable in your model the the um, of something basically the result of that email, you, you're gonna get, um, basically your model and training will look very, very good, uh, but in production will tank because you'll have data that is actually not available in production. Remember uh, what I said is the, uh, the, uh, the score, model is being scored before the email goes out. So you don't know whether the person clicked on the email yet. Um, there's an example, I again personally have uh, run into this. This is a very uh, tricky problem because uh, you will not find this through validation or testing. You only find this out if you have a circular logic problem in uh, production or if you run a correlation analysis, that can also help. So, so through some data understanding, um, such as correlation analysis, understanding of what the variables are, are they regarded as noise by the domain experts is needed. Yes, use the advanced techniques um, you know, auto data cleansing techniques that, you know, uh, um, uh, various methodologies have and even IBM has uh, to use that. But be aware that doesn't preclude uh, mean that you just can totally ignore the data understanding step. Okay, another worst technique I've seen a while, uh, and I'll explain the asterisks on this in a moment, is you want to use all the data to build them up. So, you know, a lot of organizations have huge data sets now and they're like, okay, well, we spent a lot of money gathering this, so let's use all the data to build the model. Um, and, you know, um, um, but there's a consequence of that. So if you, the more data, no matter what technique you use, the more data you use, the longer time it takes to build the model. I mean, that's just a fact. Um, but there's also a danger uh, if you use all the data because you can lead to what's called overfit, which means the models are so um, specific to your data set that they don't generalize for new patterns. Um, and when you use the entire data set, you're more actually more likely to get overfit because you don't have you haven't saved any data to for an extra validation for an extra testing run. Um, and so um, you and, and especially if there's a change in pattern. Um, 
your your model will probably not be flexible enough to understand this pattern because you you built on everything. There's no new data to challenge the model um, the, the the model parameters uh, based on what you built. Um, so um, so a, a final worst practice is that my problem is unique. I need a special algorithm to solve it. So um, that's. Uh, uh, that's actually not true in a lot in most cases. So the, if, if your problem, it, data science has been used in a wide variety of business problems, uh, including things like, you know, you know, marketing, maintenance, fraud detection, etc. And unless you're doing a really cutting edge kind of technique that, uh, you know, you don't really, you, you know, no one, you have no other competitors in the market doing what you're doing. Um, it's almost certainly the case that your model has been built by someone else using a technique um, that uh, that is out there, published either through a, um, you know a proprietary algorithms uh, such as found in IBM SPSS Modeler or open source. So yes, you may now maybe you can find if you spend enough time an algorithm or develop an algorithm that produces a better lift. But is it worth it? That's the question. You know, um, I know that like uh, a lot of the uh, Kegel competitions have gone spent time finding uh, people spend a lot of time trying to find a marginal improvement in your model. So that's all well and good, but can, is it worth your time to spend weeks and months to build and all find algorithms marginal list? Lift. So uh, there are many algorithms available in open source and commercial tools that can be used to solve most problems. So in general. Try those first and on, only go to the special algorithm if those really just produce, you know, unacceptable results. Uh, and uh, there's a little issue with my presentation. The uh, best practice for using all the data is in a lot of situations, a properly constructed sample will produce a good model. Now, for the asterisk, I, you know, there can be exceptions, you know, so a large, you know, companies, a lot of the Silicon Valley companies have, enormous, you know, a, just you know, mind-boggling amounts of data, and that you know, so these you know uh, 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 contentions may actually do apply to them. They might have a special problem. They might find value of using all the data. They might find you know, data understanding is not necessary. But you know, think carefully before assuming that these principles are true. They're not. That's not always the case. Okay. So, um, um, all right. Let's. Uh, Let's uh, move on here. Okay, so tips for success. So, so let's consider the data science journey. So, um, you know, when you're starting a project, there's a lot of challenges that you, you know a lot of you have to face. So, you you know, when you start, you have to find the data, connect to data sources. The data science leader has to worry about skills, understanding of uh, of the use case, security. When you're modeling or you know prototyping, you know the data scientists have to clean the data, build the models, uh, you know find um, uh, find how accurate they are. Um, the leader has other concerns like security, productivity, uh, you know the ROI. Uh, then once you start moving into production, uh, there's the matter of how do you get these uh, models or pipelines into production? Uh, you know doing quality assurance, uh, updating the models. The leader still has concerns about security, quality, productivity, resources, uh, knowledge loss, and audibility. And then in the full deployment, um, there's you know new concerns such around scalability, integration, et cetera, as well as meeting uh, customers' uh, performance expectations. So, so things um, that data science have to, leaders have to consider, which you know draw upon the uh, best practices I, I mentioned earlier, is that you need to build a balanced team. So you can't just rely on one single data scientist. You can't rely on you know a couple of key people. You need um, people with a variety of skill sets, uh, uh, which I'll explain in a moment, including the business experts, domain experts in IT. You need um, you know um, be able you, you you would ideally can avoid the issues around. You know, having multiple systems and multiple data sets um, in different places, so you can connect your data algorithms and apps. And then you also need the way to operationalize your models. So, um, to a lot of models uh, today have ended up uh, on the still on the desktop um, without without being deployed. 
And so how, so thing you have to start from the beginning is how do you make sure the models you built will be deployed uh, in, a, in a good way? So, so I, I contend that data science is a team sport. So if you rely on the single unicorn or rock star, uh, maybe it'll solve your problem, but that person's impossible to find. Um, if that person leaves, you're, 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 you're stuck. Um, and you haven't involved IT or the business line of business, even if you have that person. And so your models may not reflect um, their needs. So by involving many people, such as the business analyst or the line of business manager, uh, developer or the IT and or the IT administrator, data engineer to, to prepare your data, um, there's the you know technical data scientist, the ones who know R and Python. But if you can't find uh, enough R and Python programmers, there are you know as I mentioned tools out there that when you build models without code, and that's where the business or citizen data scientists can help. So a successful project needs to have the business leader, the data science leader, and the architecture or IT leader working together. They need um, from the start of the project. So when this is the, sort of the um, um, where I mentioned, oh, you need executive involvement. Uh, this is sort of a, a more uh, detail on you know what kind of executive involvement you need. So from the business leader, they you need they want to make sure that the um, the problems are solving you know the data sciences are are solving the business problems. Um, and uh, are, 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 you know, are, are leading to our, are in core of the business goals. The data science leader is sort of the, uh, the, the key stakeholder in terms of working with these other groups, making sure the data science team uh, is being productive and can meet, also meet the, um, um, the business goals as well as various security and governance mandates. Um, the architecture and IT leader provides that technical direction, especially for deployment. Um, and can make sure once you know needs to be involved to make sure that the models produced by the data science team can be deployed while keeping with the um, you know um, uh, aligned with the uh, IT architecture for the organization in various directions such as you know whether the usage of open source or or, or vendors. So so here's a, a, a sort of a, a picture of a of a, a crisp DM like methodology. Uh, going from you know business understanding to you know understand your problem, data understanding, making sure you understand the data, preparing the data, uh, you have to, which is often needed because many modeling techniques require a single unstructured data set, um, and then modeling itself, evaluation, and then finally deployment. So um, IBM's data science platform, as a result, we you know we are very aware of these challenges at IBM. So our platform are, is really focused on making sure that you know you can help solve these challenges um, and avoid all these worst practices so you can bring together different skill sets work together with um, you know with your business stakeholders as well as progress rapidly from exploration to production um, and including multiple clouds the complete analytic life cycle and you know operate e ease of operations all right, so that's uh, that's my presentation. So I'm going to see if there are any uh, questions. Uh, okay, what is the? Uh, all right, now I see some questions. What is the difference between a, a data engineer and a data scientist? So, so a data engineer is someone whose job is to prepare data, so massage data, change it. Like you know, a lot of data sets are disorganized. They might be stored in multiple tables, might be stored in multiple data sources. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot, but a lot of um, algorithms require all the data to be that's used for an algorithm to be stored in a single unnormalized data set. So a data engineer can be ch charged to, um, to, to, to prepare that data. Now, in a lot of cases, data scientists do this job themselves, but, but it may, uh, you know, if the data scientist's time is scarce, you may, the, the data scientists may want to work with the data engineer, give the requirements to the data engineer so the data scientists can be focused more on the actual model building process. Um, because, uh, you know, where so the data engineer doesn't necessarily need to know about algorithms like decision trees or neural networks or support vector machines, but the data scientists would. Um, so a question, what is the ideal team size? What's too large? Well, 
Um, you know, it's like with any team. I mean, there's no right answer. Um, I mean, data scientists do prefer to collaborate with other people. Um, you often need that um, uh, collaboration to bounce ideas. Um, but, you know, if there's a team of hundreds of people, that can be very difficult. I mean, now, certainly as organizations, large organizations will have multiple data scientists, um, perhaps in multiple teams. Um, so one idea to make sure if that is the case in your organizations, make sure there's a data science uh, community of practice where um, data scientists can collaborate and bounce ideas, uh, discuss uh, techniques. Um, and as often you really need one in your organization because a lot of your business problems may be some things you can't post on external forums. Um, you know, if there's sensitive data or the, or the problem sensitive, but if you have an internal organization um, that you can share and collaborate with, um, then that can uh, really help. But, you know, um, but, you know, certainly uh, if you have, you know, dozens or hundreds of data scientists, I would think you would need multiple teams just, um, you know, from a manageability point of view. Um, so uh, methodologies other than CRISPR-DM. So, um, Let's say one of our top, um, uh, the uh, top, uh, uh, an, an, another comp a competitor of IBM does have its own methodology. I won't mention it. Um, there, I've seen a number of consulting companies produce um, methodologies as well. Uh, so um, I'm aware of a couple of consulting companies that have produced it. Um, IBM itself um, has, um, there's a, if you look at a, a Google, a blog called O to the, um, um, O to the data science grease monkeys. There's a, a proposed alternative methodology, um, but CRISPR-DM is the one that has been the most, let's say, fully developed, has the most documentation, um, and the most sort of um, it's it's the one that has the most um, sort of uh, meat behind it. Um, it has a deficiency in that it doesn't really go into a lot of detail on deployment. Um, so that's where, and maybe you want to use multiple methodologies, uh, or you will may have to draw upon an IT-based methodology for your deployment. But I, I, I personally feel that CRISPR-DM is, um, is still the best overall methodology for data science. Um, so, um, so you mentioned the concept of a citizen data scientist who's not creating new algorithms, which I've titled use when hiring this resource. Um, yeah, there's, um, I mean, you could still call this person a data scientist uh, if you want, or you could call them a business analyst. Or you know, or data miner, the old title for uh, data scientist. Um, so this is the kind of person who isn't, uh, you know, either um, a, an expert at R and Python or just doesn't want to program. I actually, personally, I uh, you know, I spent many years using SPSS Modeler, um, not because I, I can't code. I've code, you know, I've learned how to code, uh, but I I prefer the visual productivity of using SPSS Modeler. But you know, um, yeah, it is a little harder to tease it out. Um, but what a lot of organizations have done for citizen data scientists is they look within their own organization. Um, so they might find, let's say, a business analyst who's taken some statistics courses is very familiar with the data and then can, um, um, can be sort of taught to build the models or with some additional training. So um, using, you know, you don't uh, under, you know, underestimate the ability of resources within your organization or people who have, you know, you know, necessarily aren't R and Python programmers, but have a lot of experience in building models uh, through a visual tool to, uh, to be effective and, and um, we've got a lot of organizations in production today using uh, tools like SVSS model. Um, Mentioned the unicorn does not exist. Does do I need to have multiple data scientists who have minimal capacity? Um, so, I mean, there are unicorns out there. I, I have met people who have all these skill sets. Um, what I'm saying is, so it's not that they don't exist, except that they're very rare. They're very hard to find. Uh, they might cost the organization a lot of money. Um, and even if you find that person, if that person leaves, what are you gonna do, right? Uh, data scientists are rare commodities. There's a lot of, uh, um, there's, there's a, there's a lot of um, 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 there's a lot of uh, uh, need to uh, um, to to um, um, sorry there's a lot of need uh, to, a lot of people competing for their time so it, it, that can be uh, um, uh, pretty hard so that's why a team of people can be very helpful. Um, what needs to be in the portfolio to show skill sets? Uh, you know, try, you know, definitely show the that you built a model, you prepared the data. 
uh, you've used multiple data sources, you've worked with larger data sets. Is there a way to know how much data is enough to train a model? Um, well, it depends on, you know, um, you know, at least you definitely, uh, for a lot of techniques, you definitely need several thousand rows of data, uh, but you don't need like billions of rows of data. That's why I was saying you don't need all the data in some cases. Um, it does depend on how much data is in the production data set and how much um, um, the, um, uh, the, you know, uh, the production data uh, and the type of business problem. Uh, data scientists need no SQL DB skills. Well, it depends on where the data um, uh, resides. You know, I mean, some organizations are using no SQL and that uh, databases like Mongo, so definitely uh, you need that. But a lot of organizations still use relational databases. So, uh, and even with no SQL, there are tools like um, that can use, you can root SQL queries on these no SQL uh, databases. So it does depend on your organization's willingness to invest in tools. Um, some organizations have made a very firm commitment to it be 100% open source. If that's the case, then yeah, you probably do need to code to work for that organization. Um, see, so common threads across industries and verticals. Um, well, a lot of the algorithms that uh, uh, you use in data science, decision trees, neural networks, uh, support vector machines are used in many business problems, many industries, many verticals. So uh, data preparation is, is very common. So the whole CRISPR-DM methodology was designed, in fact, to be industry neutral and vendor neutral. So if you look at the CRISPR-DM, you, you would understand you know, what, what is needed. Uh, um, so, um, so anyone advice working as a data scientist not see many of the team sport aspects of the organizational culture. Yeah. So if your organizational culture is really focused on the lone individual performing heroics, I mean, that, that, that can be very challenging. You do need a culture that values teamwork, values working collaboratively across the organization, collaboratively with the team. If, if the culture is, to say, unless you do everything yourself, we don't value you, uh, then, I mean, certainly you can try to raise that up in your organization, but, uh, you know, um, uh, but if they don't want to address that, that can be very challenging. So I don't really have a good answer for you. Um, so uh, what kind of test and validation procedure do you offer in a big data mining project to minimize errors of various efforts? So you certainly, you always need testing and validation in building your model. There's certainly, you know, techniques such as cross-validation can be helpful with smaller data sets. But some of the problems that I mentioned before, such as circular logic, a spurious correlation, isn't going to be solved by testing and validation. So you, this is where our data understanding uh, needs to be, um, to, uh, needs to be um, done. But, you know, like, um, but certainly you actually, testing and validation is, is, is an important part of the process. Uh, GDPR, so yeah, GDPR is gonna be a, a challenge, um, um, especially since uh, the ability, the requirement to be able to remove data. But one thing I have always noticed, uh, I've always said is that data science does not require sensitive personal information in a lot of cases. You don't need people's ID numbers. You don't need people's names or addresses or things like that. Um, so um, it, um, it, uh, uh, you can often anonymize the IDs um, and, to, um, uh, and, and that can be very, uh, produce perfectly good models without having any sensitive personal information. Um, how does one become a data scientist? Um, so, you know, there's certainly programs out there, um, academic programs to teach you. There's uh, you know, courses. Uh, there's a lot of free, um, if you go on Google, there's a lot of um, training programs out there. Uh, but, you know, nothing, there's nothing like doing your own data science project. That's really the best training. Um, what do you recommend as best practices for getting IT leaders on board in the mindset to growing the uh, and growing the data before expanding the team? So, so you certainly need to have get your data IT leaders uh, an understanding of data science. You know, sort of a brief them on what is the value of data science. Perhaps go explore about you know. There's a lot of examples where data science has brought ROI, but then also go through a methodology and explain, for instance, things like. Before you start, you, you, it's not just about the structure of a data set or you know the names of the columns. It's the patterns that uh, that are mentioned um, 
uh, in the data. So um, that that's certainly um, um, that are very important. That's what I think IT leaders really need to understand. That again, it's not just you give the requirements and you get some program out. You have to spend time understanding the data and really researching an unknown thing before you can get a successful outcome. Um, so I, I don't think met, is participating in Kaggle a bad idea. No, I don't think it's a bad idea. I'm just saying that um, that uh, trying. I mentioned Kaggle. Some Kaggle competitions were the idea of let's try to build some marginally um, better model um, that uh, you know that may you know it, it took them weeks or months to do, and you get you know a, a, a marginal better output. Um, I, I, I don't feel that's worthwhile, but, you know, certainly participating on your own is a very valuable learning exercise. So, I, I mean, I would say participate. I'm, I'm just arguing that um, from, the organiz uh, from an organizational point of view, you don't need necessarily new techniques to solve your business problem. Um, so a, a business analyst, what is that? A business analyst is a person who basically um, understands the business problem very well and understands the data that is used to solve that business problem. So they're, they're experts on the data, but maybe not through a technical tool. They might be using uh, Cognos, for instance, or some other reporting tool uh, to go through the data, but they know their data, that person's data inside and out. Um, but yeah, they're not, they don't necessarily know SQL. They certainly won't know R and Python and may not even know much about predictive modeling, but they might have the right mindset to learn about. Um, uh, elaborate more about the job of, of the IT. Well, there's lots of IT jobs, <laughs> and so that's a hard question. Uh, but when I'm saying getting IT involved, I'm thinking the IT administrator, the system administrator, the IT manager, the people in charge of putting things in production. Those are the people you absolutely need involved in your um, um, in, in your project. So, ideas how to evaluate open source or commercial tools. So, um, open source has certainly um, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of good uh, things about open source with a lot of techniques available. And my argument, uh, a commercial tool, the best commercial tools allow you to run open source. So you get the both of both worlds. So you use the commercial tool to do things, for instance, that may be difficult in open source, like, um, like a visual tool uh, for the non-programmer or governance or lineage or, um, or, you know, collaboration. You know, that's where the commercial tool can really bring added value, but you can still use open source techniques within the commercial tool, I would argue. So you definitely, if you're evaluating commercial tool, make sure that it lets you include open source. Um, bias and models very much in the news today. Any thoughts on how to recognize and manage that? Um, so um, that's, yeah, so that's, that's definitely a challenge. Um, you know, you wanna make sure you're, the data you use to build the model has been gathered in an unbiased way. A lot of the uh, challenges in, the, in these biased models have come from open source or crowdsourced training data, where you and the organization don't really have much control over what that data is. So uh, uh, a lesson learned a long time ago with modeling is garbage in, garbage out. So if your training data is garbage, like it has the wrong inferences or the wrong information, then the models you produce are gonna be garbage as well. Um, so, this is where, again, data understanding is critical, right? Especially if you've crowdsourced the training data. So if you don't know, or you know, some people in the public have created that training data, and this is where they can introduce a lot of bias. The results may not be uh, representative of the actual patterns out there. So that is where um, you, know, you really need um, an understanding data. Um, what are the best practices to find proven algorithms for common business problems? Well, yeah, there's a lot of algorithms out there. I, I, I've taken an agnostic approach to algorithm. You know, just use the algorithm that, produ that produces the best. But it really does depend on the nature of your data. You know, some algorithms are better for our symbolic data. Others are better for numeric data. This does require more, somewhat of a training and knowledge of the various algorithms to, at least at a high level, to understand their strengths and weaknesses. Um, all right, so we have about 10 minutes. Uh, collaboration between data scientists and UX de designers, especially in the context of data visualization. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, um, so visualization is certainly very important in understanding your data. So, um, you know, you a lot of tools do have uh, good uh, visualization uh, out there. Open source has good visualization capabilities. Um, 
but um, yeah, I don't know if I have too much to say on that one. So let me go on on that. Um, trusted sources, latest advancement on algorithms and methodologies, uh, and journals, um, um, things like that. So um, uh, the um, so I'm. So in my view, an algorithm that has made it to a common open source platform, like, you know, Spark ML Lib, H2O, Python, Scikit-Learn, that's a common algorithm because those are all curated libraries, right? So it's not, um, R is a little harder because anyone can create an R algorithm. So if, if it's an algorithm um, that is, um, you know, available in open source, uh, libraries is available in a lot of commercial tools, then it has been well accepted. Um, if it's just available in R and, and not a lot of downloads, probably not so much. Um, so um, on a side note, what do I recommend as preferred data format with working large data sets and which scenarios would be limited by RAM and in-memory constraints? So um, with very large data sets, what you want to do is find a way to bring your analytics to the data, not take the data out. Um, so, um, so, uh, so we, we have an option in, in SPSS modeler to bring the analytics to Hadoop. Um, you, you can bring um, in some databases, they have in database algorithms, so you can bring the analytics to the data. That's really the best way um, because that way um, you're usually you're the, play, the systems hosting the large data sets have more power and more um, uh, capacity and you don't have to worry about data transfer. Can data be biased? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, how effective to solve a business problem as a whole? So that's where understanding your data is really relevant. Um, if you're really not sure about your uh, model uh, before deployment, do a definitely, you know, validate it, do a proof of concept or do a prototype, and meaning you deploy your, you pretend to deploy your model, but you don't take any action on it. So then you can sort of see, you know, is your model producing good results or not? Um, so uh, you, this is where again data understanding is critical um, uh, is to prevent. Make sure you have biased data. Uh, typical project time from start to production. Uh, well, that that's highly variable. Uh, when I was a consultant, though, for a proof of concept, we would say three months is sort of generally a good time for a proof of concept. Um, but you know, production projects can you know take much much longer depending on your organization. Um, Steps to study uh, in data science. Um, so you should, if you want to study to be a data scientist, definitely understand statistics, understand the algorithms, get comfortable with big data, uh, with larger data sets, um, knowing how to access data from various data sources such as databases and Hadoop is helpful. Get um, In a lot of cases that does require code, but there are tools to do that without code. Um, uh, all right, so I'm gonna uh, stop here. Um, thank you all very much, um, and, uh, and, and uh, it was a good conversation. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.